Welcome everyone to this lesson on regression analysis with R. In today's lesson, we are going to focus on linear probability model, logic and probit models. So my name is Elijah Pia from Ghana. I am an economist by profession and I really love R. So it's the very reason why all the time you will see me smiling as it's reflected um, on my picture on the screen. You can reach me through my email and the goals for this lesson will be to understand how to estimate qualitative response models and also advance your knowledge of statistical inference for limited dependent variables. Now, this is part of the lecture series that we're going to have. So far, we are still on regression analysis, and I believe that our next lesson, we just move on to comparing two means. Now, for limited dependent variables, sometimes the dependent variable may be categorical, right? And so if we have two categories, we normally call it binary or dichotomous. If there are three categories of the dependent variable, we say trichotomous, four or more categories, we just simply say polychotomous. But for this particular lesson, we are going to focus on the dependent variable or the response variable being binary. That means it has only two categories. Now, the independent variables, they may be quantitative, qualitative, or mixed as usual. And so examples of binary variables include um, variables that normally take the form of yes or no responses. So technically, we treat them a similar way as we treat dummy variables. So we tend to assign the values of zero and one to each of these categories. So for instance, zero for no, one for yes. And maybe you can also go on ahead to say patient satisfaction. So you want to look at whether a patient at the hospital was satisfied with the services rendered by the hospital. So you have not satisfied, you may code it as zero and then satisfy, you code it as one. Now, whether you code a particular category as zero or one depends entirely on you. Yet the intuition for which you are going to do this sort of value labeling assignment, you should really know exactly how to interpret it. So we can also have health outcome, maybe not killed versus killed. And then the votes, you may want to vote for a Democrat or a Republican candidate. Now there are three approaches to measuring binary response models. And the first one is the linear probability model normally LPM as an abbreviation for short. The second one is logistic regression or the logit model. And the third one is the probit or the normit model. Now, the linear probability model, what is it about? It means that we are estimating the binary response variable using the ordinary least squares method. And this OLS is what we've been using when we were treating the linear regression model. All right. And so the coded values of the binary dependent variable, which are zero and one, are simply treated as numbers, not categories. So take notice of that. When you are using the OLS for the estimation, your value label assignments of zero and one for the dependent variable are treated as numbers and not as a categorical uh, variable. So let us consider the regression model y equals beta zero plus beta one x where X is the family income and Y is a binary dependent variable with Y equals one if the family owns a house and zero if it does not own a house. So maybe technically Y is just simply house ownership. Now the expectation is that we are going to calculate the expected value of Y given the values of X. And so it is the conditional probability that the event will occur given X. This simply means that we are just trying to calculate the probability that the family is going to own a house, that is y equals one, given the family income, which is x. And so this is how the regression model is going to be as far as linear probability model is concerned. Hence, we call this the linear probability model. Now, if P is the probability that y equals one, that is a family will own a house, and one minus P will be the probability that Y equals zero, that is the family will not own the house, then the variable Y will have the probability distribution as is shown on the screen. So you notice that if you sum up the probability that the family will own a house and the probability that the family will not own a house, that simply equals one. This distribution is said to follow the Bernoulli 
probability distribution or just probability distribution for sure. Or if you remember when we're dealing with foundations of probability in R in one of our earlier lessons, we covered what we call the binomial probability distribution. It's exactly the same process. Now there's one fundamental rule of probability. That is, it should lie between zero and one with these values inclusive. But the real problem with using the OLS method to estimate the linear probability model is that this rule of probability is often violated because the predicted probabilities, when you make a prediction, the values can be negative, that is less than zero, and it can also be greater than one as well. So this is the very real problem of linear probability models. There are other problems such as the model by definition is just simply going to be heteroscedastic. All right, it's just simply going to be heteroscedastic. So as for heteroscedasticity, you can just simply solve this by obtaining standard errors that are robust to this heteroscedasticity problem, all right? And then one other problem with linear probability model is that it's likely to have a very low R squared. And remember that R squared is used to determine the goodness of fit of regression models. And if you have a very low R squared, then your model is not really performing very well. So let us go ahead and practice what this is all about. Now, there is a fictitious data set. Right, so when we come into R, then we are going to use the very first data set, which happens to be the hypothetical data on home ownership and income. If you look at the regression model that I stated earlier, we are looking at whether a family owns a house or not. Uh, dependent on the income of the family. It's just a hypothetical data and it's not a real data set, but we just want to experiment with what is going to happen with linear probability models. So we need to go ahead and load it. Now at the bottom right hand side, I'm going to click on the files and you would notice that I have the house ownership data set in there. So I'm going to go ahead and load it and I will save it into an object called DF, which is short for data frame. And I'm just going to say, read.csv and then I will just simply give the name of the file so house ownership .csv and then I will load this and when that happens if I click on the df now this is the data set that we are going to work with and there are 40 observations and there are three variables and so the three variables we have family y and x and the family is just the number of families for which the data was collected, although hypothetical. The Y simply represents the house ownership, where one equals the fact that the family owns a house and zero is the family that does not own a house. And then X is the family income. Now, what really happens with linear probability model is that we're just simply going to go ahead and estimate um, a linear probability model just using the normal LM function for the estimation of linear regression uh, models. So what we are going to do is let's simply go ahead and create a model object and use the LM function where we are regressing the variable Y on X. And then we specify our data equals DF. And then if you should run this and go ahead and summarize the model, then we are getting this regression result. This is what we mean by linear probability model. And so we have the intercept to be negative and the family income is positive. So this means there is a positive relationship between family income and the fact that the family is going to own a house. So it gives us the same results as if we were dealing with the normal linear regression model. Somehow, these values are simply probabilities, all right? Now, the whole thing is that, just like we said, the real problem with linear probability models is that the predicted probabilities will violate the rule of probability that it should lie between zero and one. So we need to find out for ourselves how the predictions are going to be. And so we will just create another object called PRED, which is short for predicted values. And then we'll just simply use the predict function in R and just simply pass into it the model. And then we'll go ahead and predict it. 
So when we finish, we can simply run the PREG to see what the predicted values are, all right? So these are what we refer to as the predicted probabilities that a family will own a house. Now I'm going to make this PREG part of the data frame. So I'm just going to say DF, and remember, we need the tidyverse. So I'll go ahead and load the tidyverse package. So we have tidyverse. And then we'll just simply grab the data frame and we will mutate, create a new column called props, which happens to be the probabilities. And then we'll set it equal to the predicted values that we have here. Okay, that is one way to do that. Another way is to use the bind calls to bind it to the data frame, but this is just okay. So if you should run this and go back to the data frame, you'll notice that we have the probabilities right here. Now, the thing to do right now is we just want to visualize and see whether our predicted probabilities are going to lie between zero and one. And so we'll go ahead and use the ggplot function, and then we specify the data equals df, and then our aesthetics we would say x and then y, and then we simply create a scatter plot from the data frame. So when we run that, this is the graph that we have. So on the x axis, we have the family income, and then on the y axis, we do have the y equals one, which is a family owns a house and y equals zero, a family does not own a house. So you notice that the points are simply clustered around the value zero and that of one, because these are the only two values that we have in the data set. And somehow you would notice that the scale of the y axis is such that I'll treat the y as if it were a continuous variable. Yet we know that it takes only two values, zero and one, so it is discrete in nature. So there are a few tweaks that I want to do with this sort of data. And so once we have this sort of information, this is what I'm going to do. Now I can also initiate the ggplot function. And then I would go ahead and add my geometry layer, zoom point. And with the aesthetics, I will set the x axis to x and the y axis to y. And then I'll pass the data simply into the geom point function. And that will yield the same sort of result. Great. So why don't I simply go on ahead and place the data into the ggplot function so that any other layer that we place right here would inherit the data frame right there. Now, if I pass the data into the geom point function, it means that any other layer I am adding up, I need to be specifying the data equals the df, else it will not be able to inherit it. So at this point, what is going to happen is we will go on ahead and give some labels. So we'll just use the labs function where we set x simply to be equal to family income which is in dollars. And then we'll set the Y axis to house ownership and run that. So now we have the X and Y axis labels. And then let's give it a proper title. So we have title. Would be family income by house ownership. Something like that. Okay, now that we have this, what would be the predicted equation, right? If I go on ahead and say geom smooth, remember if you want to overlay the regression equation or the line of best fit, you just simply have to use the geom smooth layer and then you specify the method argument to a linear model. And that's exactly what we did. And so if we go on ahead and run that, it says we should check the required aesthetics, X and Y. Hmm. 
Okay, so somehow, let me just simply grab this and place it into the ggplot function to inherit it. And let's run it again and see what result we're going to get. Okay, that really works. So the whole thing is, when I specify the aesthetics into the geom point function, it is the geom point function that only takes the aesthetics and creates the visual elements on the plot. However, when I place it into the ggplot function, every other layer that I specify will inherit from the ggplot um, arguments. All right. So once we have this, I want to tune off the standard errors associated with the line of best fit. That is the shaded regions around the line of best fit. And so I will set the SE argument to false. So that if I go ahead and run that, now we have just the line. Now you can see that the line moves beyond the y equals one and y equals zero. And how are we able to determine that? This is what I want to do. I want to insert a horizontal line. So I'm using the zoom line layer. And then there is an argument in there called the y intercept, which I'm going to give it a vector of zero and one. And that means it is going to plot horizontal lines at zero and that of one. So if I run that line of code, you can see clearly the zero and one bounds of probability. Yet the regression equation extends beyond these lines. Now, if I want to clear the zoom smooth and perhaps use the probabilities that we have calculated for in the data frame, then I can do that and then simply come here and specify another zoom point layer. But this time around is going to be a line. So we just make a zoom line. And in that layer, we are just going to go ahead and give it the aesthetics x against the predicted probabilities, which have which has been named as props in the data frame. And so if we should run these lines of code, would that give us the same results? Wonderful. Now, at this point, this is what I want to do. I want to be able to shade the part where the values are between zero and one and the part which go beyond the thresholds, the probability thresholds. And so in order to do this, I just need to go ahead and just simply color this as red. And then I would use the line type argument and set it to dashed. So I am coloring the line of best fit red, and then I'm using the line type called dashed. And if I should run that line of code, we see clearly what is happening. Let me go into the zoom point and use the size argument to make the point three times larger. Run it again, and then we have this result. Wonderful. Now, just a, just a little tweak, you know? So I would want to label my y, my one value on the y axis here as y equals one, and then that of the 0, 0.0 here as y equals zero, and the middle value just simply 0 0.5. And if I want to do that, there is a scale that is being used because there is a default scale, so we need to override it. So I'm going to use scale underscore y underscore continuous because R treats the Y axis scale as if it were continuous value. And then there are two sets of arguments that I, I would want to pass in there. The first one is the bricks, which will be used to break the kind of um, axis ticks that are supposed to be present. So for instance, if I say zero and one, and then run these lines of code, Then you notice that we have the zero and that of the one. Good. Then I can give it labels. So I'll say labels equals a vector of the names that should be used to name the bricks. So I will simply say y equals zero, and then a character of y equals one. 
if I highlight these lines of code and I run, then you notice that I have y equals one and then y equals zero. I can go ahead and say this is the probability that y equals zero, and this is also the probability that y equals one as the labels and highlight these lines of code and run it again. Great. Now I would want to also insert another line plot, the line of best faith, to cover the part where the predicted probabilities are between zero and one. And so in order to do this, let me go on ahead and add another zoom line element and then specify my aesthetics to be X and then the probabilities. But this time around, we'll have to explicitly specify a data argument, which is going to grab the data frame and then we'll simply filter the data where the probabilities are greater than or equal to zero and the probabilities are less than or equal to one. And if I should go ahead and highlight these lines of code and run, let's see what is gonna happen. Then you can see that we have the black line overshadowing the red dashed lines. So clearly, one more thing that I want to do is simply to use one of the inbuilt themes in R called the theme light so that everything becomes very clear. And then if I should go on ahead, cannot add. So we have the theme light, right? Let's run it again. And so did you forget to add this object to a GG plot? Something is wrong. Yes. Okay. All right. So this is where the issue is. There's supposed to be a plus here, which adds up all these layers as well. So let's go on ahead, highlight these lines of code and run it again. Great. And now if we zoom into the plot, this is exactly what we have. So you can see that the predicted probabilities we had those values which are shaded by the black line, okay, the black solid line as the predicted probabilities which lie between the zero and that of the one. But there are predicted probabilities which go beyond the probability that Y equals one, that is a family will own a house. And we also have predicted probabilities that are less than zero. This is the real problem with linear probability models. So at this point, if we should go back to the slides and then continue from there, you would notice that this is the exact same plot that we replicated in there. And so we do have the predicted probabilities where some of the values are actually greater than one and some of the values are also negative, which are less than one. So how do we get around this probability problem? Now, we can estimate the linear probability model using the usual ordinary least squares method. If we find now that the estimated y, which is the predicted probabilities, do have some values that are less than zero, which is negative, then we will assume y to be equal to zero for those cases. And if we also find out that some of the probabilities are actually greater than one, then we assume them to be equal to one so that we set up what we call a constrained linear probability model. Another way to get around this problem is to devise some estimating techniques that will guarantee that the estimated conditional probabilities of the estimated Y will lie between zero and one, fulfilling the rule or the requirement of probability. And so these estimating techniques are simply the logic and the probit models. So I want us to go ahead into R and just try to see how this constrained linear probability model also works. So when we go right into R, we will just simply go on ahead and recreate the same sort of plot, but this time with a few other tweaks in there. So we'll set our data equals the DF, our X axis to X, that is the family income and Y axis to Y, which happens to be the um, house ownership. And then we'll go on ahead and plot our points. And so if we just run these two lines of code, we get this result, right? 
Great. Now, if we go ahead and then insert our zoom line, where we specify the aesthetics X and this time around the probabilities that we predicted and run that line of code as well, we end up fitting the line of best fit. Now, at this point, I will just go on ahead and add my zoom H line, the scale continuous and all those sort of things. So plus, And then if I should highlight these lines of code and run, this is exactly what we had. We make the size of the points three times larger. We run. But now what is really going to happen is that if we look at the data frame, the probabilities, we'll have to create another column where we will have to create a condition where if the value is negative, we set it equal to a probability of zero. And if the value is greater than one, we force it to become one so that we constrain the fact that the rule of probability is being violated. So we need to create another column. So let me just come up here and simply call this one constraint. But at this point, hmm, how do we do this? We grab the data frame and then we'll go on ahead and create a new column using the mutate verb. And then the new column is going to be constrained, which simply equals, and then we use an if else condition. Now the if else condition will take three set of arguments. The first one is the condition. And so we would say, if else, the probabilities that we have calculated simply is greater than one, set it to one. So the second argument is what is going to be evaluated if this condition is true. Now, the third argument is going to be what should be evaluated if this condition becomes false. So we use that opportunity to create another if else. And then we set another condition where if the probabilities are actually less than zero, then you would also have to assign the value of zero. Otherwise, just simply use the normal probabilities. And so this is how we end up creating our new column. So if the probability is greater than one, set it equal to one. If this is false, then let's go ahead to the second if else. If it is less than zero, set it equal to zero. Then the last thing, if all of these events are false, then simply set it equal to the exact probability that we have there. So if we highlight this and run and go back to our data frame, you will notice that for the negative value here, it was assigned the value of zero. And then if we should go down here to 1.09, it was assigned the value of one. So we are constraining the fact that the probabilities must lie between zero and one. Now, when that happens, if we come here and then we would go on ahead. In fact, when we inserted the zoom line layer, that is exactly the sort of line of best fit that goes beyond the, um, the threshold, the probability thresholds. But if we constrain it, then what is going to happen? So let us insert another zoom line where our aesthetics is going to be X and the Y is now going to be the constrained variable that we have created in the data frame. And when that happens, we'll just go on ahead and color this as blue and then set the size to twice a size. And let's see exactly what is going to happen. So if I highlight these lines of code and run, then you would notice from the graph, all right, so we're using a lot of memory. So I'll just go on ahead here and free on use our memory. Great, now let's zoom in again. And wonderful, we have it here. So when we constrain the probabilities to lie between zero and one, you see that somehow, look at how the blue line trends, all right? It is kind of becoming some S shape, great. But the point is, if you force to allow negative values to be assumed to be zero and values or predicted probabilities that are greater than one to be assumed to be one, then you are losing what we call some information. All right, because probabilities are linearly related to the, the, the independent variable in the model. So that is why by virtue of the fact that the line of best fit goes beyond the probability thresholds. So by constraining that linear probability model, you end up losing some information 
and throwing some out of the model and forcing them to be something that they are not. So there is some level of bias in there. However, this should give us an idea about what to do next. So if you recall from the slides, we mentioned that another method that we should use is to devise an estimating technique that will ensure that the estimated conditional probabilities will actually lie between zero and one. This is where the logic and the probit models come into the scene. And so the logic model. Now, there are what we call cumulative distribution functions, all right? And they are actually sigmoid or S-shaped curves. And so there is a function in R, if you go on ahead and take the random normal distribution of 500 sample size, and then you, you place it into the plot.ecdf function, you will notice that the points are plotted and it looks like an S-shaped curve. And you can see that we have the probability threshold zero and that of one. So some of the cumulative distribution functions that we are going to use in estimating the binary dependent variable are simply the logistic cumulative distribution function, which is called the logit, and the standard normal cumulative distribution function, which is also called the probit. That is all that they are. So let's take, for instance, we have this sort of information available in the data, all right? We are working with categorical variables, so there is a match, and we want to determine whether a team would win or would lose. Now at this point, so we have a match that is being played by a particular team a number of times, and we can see clearly that the team won four times and lost six times. So there are 10 observations there. Now the thing is, what can we do with this sort of data? Of course, we can go ahead and create a frequency distribution table to know the number of wins and the number of losses by that team. But if you have a frequency distribution data, uh, table, then you most likely can go ahead and calculate the probability that the team is going to win the match. But there's one more thing that you can go ahead and calculate, the odds of winning the match. So this is where these betting companies do have the odds that, for instance, Portugal, Portugal against Ghana, maybe Portugal is going to win, and then the odds that Ghana is also going to win. These are where some of these instances are coming from, using track of the history of, of their performance, okay? So you can calculate the probability that the team is going to win or the odds that the team is going to win. So from this frequency distribution table, the probability is simply the number of events divided by the total outcome. So we're just simply going to calculate the probability that the team is going to win. So it's going to be the number of wins divided by the total number of observations. So four out of 10, that gives us 0 0.4, which is 40%. If we want to calculate the odds, now the odds are the chances or the likelihood that something happening to something not happening, all right? So we are going to look at the chances of winning against the losses. So we just simply divide four, which is the number of wins divided by the losses, that is six, and then we simply get 0 0.67. So the odds that this team is going to win is simply 0 0.67, or you can say 67%. Now, probability and odds can be expressed in terms of each other. Probability can be obtained if you have the odds. It's just simply odds divided by one plus the odds. And the odds is also simply probability divided by one minus the probability. So take, for instance, when we calculated the odds that the team was going to win, it was 0 0.67. If we substitute this into the probability identity, we end up getting the 0 0.40. Now, the probability of 0 0.40 that we had, the 40% chance that the team is going to win, if you also substitute that into the odds identity, we get exactly 0 0.67. Hence, probability and odds can be expressed in terms of each other. Logistic regression or logic model, it calculates the log odds. Remember, we have established the difference between probability and odds, but the logistic regression would calculate the log odds giving the values of the predictors. So if you recall the regression equation that we stated, where Y simply is the house ownership, whether or not a family owns a house, depending on the X variable, which is simply the family income, then the logistic regression is simply going to be the log odds of the expected value that the family is going to own a house, giving the family's income. All right, so this is going to be the regression equation as far as logic model is concerned. However, we need to advance it further. So recall that we said probability simply equals odds divided by one plus the odds. 
And so if logistic regression calculates the log odds, then somehow, if we want to obtain the probability that the family is going to own a house, we just go ahead and substitute the log odds there. So it's going to be log odds divided by one plus the log odds. But remember, we need odds, not log odds. So what do we do to these log odds so that they become odds? And when we divide by one plus the odds, we simply get the probability that the family will own a house. Now, there is something that is called exponential function, all right? This exponential function, when you take the exponential function of the natural logarithm of a function, is simply equal to the function. Somehow, the exponential function and the natural log cancel out, leaving you the function there. So if you have the exponential of the natural logarithm of x, you get x. If you have the exponential of the natural logarithm of 2, you get 2. All right. And so when that happens, then we need to now take the exponential function of the log odds so that the E annuls the log and we simply get our odds exactly how we need it. Then we can determine the probability. Now, keep this one in mind. All right. Which is the correct version? Because if you take the exponential of the log odds, then you are getting just simply the odds. So that's going to be odds over one plus the odds. Now, we notice that the regression model for the logistic is the log odds that the family is going to own a house simply equals the beta zero plus beta one times the family income. Now, if we substitute this log odds into the probability that y is going to be equal to one, then we are getting the exponential of the beta zero plus beta one x divided by one plus the exponential of the beta zero plus beta one x. Because the coefficient beta zero and beta one, the regression equation, are in their log odds form. So we need to take the exponential function of this regression equation in order to determine the odds of each parameter that has been estimated. Now, this probability that y is going to be equal to one can also be expressed in this form. One over one plus the inverse, the exponential inverse of the regression equation. How did we get to this? It is simply a matter of dividing each term by the exponential of beta zero and that of beta one um, xi. So you can see that when you divide each term by the exponential of the regression equation, this one gives you the one here. And then here also gives you the one. And then one divided by the exponential of the regression is simply in its inverse form. So that's exactly the same thing right here. So based on the log odds of the logistic regression model, if we assume that Z equals the regression equation, then we can simplify the probability that the family is going to own a house, giving the family's income just simply equal the exponential of Z divided by one plus the exponential of Z. And then remember, if you are dividing each term by the exponential of the Z, you simply get down here uh, one over one plus the inverse of the exponential function of Z. Now, this exponential function of z divided by one plus exponential function of z is simply what we refer to as the logistic distribution function. Now, remember in the first slide under the logic model, we said that the cumulative distribution functions are simply S-shaped. So we are going to verify whether this logistic distribution function is simply going to be S-shaped very soon. But one thing is that if you look at how the regression equation enters this logistic distribution function, it is no longer linear in X or the parameters. Remember that one of the things about regression model is that it should be linear in the uh, parameters, although it may or may not be linear in the variables. But in this case, it is non-linear in the variable X and also non-linear in the parameters because the regression equation has been um, exponentiated, all right? Good. But if you look at the log odds, the log odds here, it means that the log odds is a linear function of the parameters as well as the variables. So in logistic regression model, the log odds is a linear function of the parameters and the variables, but the logistic distribution function is not linear in the variables, all right? Which simply is the probability that we are going to calculate this. Good, let's continue. So let's go on ahead and illustrate how this logistic regression comes into the scene. So we are going to create a variable called x, which lies between negative 10 and 10. So it's a range of values from negative 10 to 10. And then 
Let us create a logistic function. So we just simply say logistic function of, so let's take maybe V. V is a short for value. So it takes in some values, all right? Or simply let me make this one the uppercase X. So uppercase X and make this one the lowercase X. All right, then let's now write a function. Remember it is one divided by one plus the exponential of negative X. So it is one divided by one plus the exponential, that is the inverse, right? Or you can simply make it e, the exponential function of X divided by one plus the exponential function again. But you remember there are two ways of doing that, okay? So we have the logistic function right here and we are going to create Y values where we are going to calculate the logistic distribution of the values of X. And so if we run this line of code and then run this function and then run this line of code, then by looking at the X values, which lies from negative 10 to 10, and then the Y values, these Y values have been log transformed in its logistic distribution. So all we have to do is to create a plot of the X and that of the Y, and let's see the shape of whatever curve or whatever it is. So you can see clearly that we are getting some kind of S-shaped curve, right? But let's tweak it a little bit so it looks like a line instead of the hollow circles or the points there. So we just go ahead and inside the base graph, we just simply say this type equals L. L means a line. In the base graph, if you say B, it means both. That is line and points. So if you run this, we have the points and we have the lines, but we need that of the line, all right? So by running this, you can clearly see that this is simply S-shaped. Let me just go ahead and make the line width twice its size and maybe color it as blue. So I'm using the base function called plot and running this, you can clearly see that the logistic distribution function is S-shaped where it lies between zero and what? One, okay? That's exactly what we are looking at. So the Y is the logistic distribution of the X values. It is simply an S-shaped. And so this logit will yield predicted probabilities to lie between zero and one, which is a problem in linear probability models. So from the logit model, we go to establish that we have just one divided by one plus exponential, which is an inverse of the regression equation. So if the probability that the family will own a house is one, this, this logistic distribution, then the probability that the family will not own a house is simply going to be one minus the probability the family will own a house. So when you take the difference, you are simply getting what is on the right here. Now, remember that if you want to calculate the odds using the probabilities, it is probability divided by one minus the probability, right? So the odds will simply be the probability that we have here divided by one minus the probability. And so this is the probability uh, where the family will own a house according to the logistic distribution. And this is also going to be the probability that the family will not own a house. And then if we take the division of these two probabilities, we are simply getting the exponential function of Z using algebra. If you manipulate it, this is exactly what you're going to get. Now, this exponential function of Z is simply what we call the OS ratio. So the OS ratio is simply the ratio of the probabilities. Okay, the ratio of something happening to something not happening. The ratio that the probability that the family will own a house divided by the probability that the family will not own a house. This is called the OS ratio. So technically, remember that the Z itself is the log odds of the regression equation. So when you take the exponential of the Z in itself, you are getting what we call the OS ratio. Now let's look at something. So this is basically what we have just determined there. Okay, the ratio of the probabilities would, is called the OS ratio or just simply the odds. Now, for instance, if the probability is 0 0.8, then to calculate the odds, we're just going to make it 0 0.8 divided by one minus 0 0.8, which equals four. Now, this means that the odds that the family will own a house is simply four to one. 
right? So if you know the probability that a team is going to win, then you will most likely be able to determine the odds that this team is going to win against losing, right? So that's exactly what this false ratio is just talking about. Great. So now that we have established that the ratio of the probabilities equals the exponential function of the log odds of the regression equation, okay? That simply gives you the odds ratio. There is also another interesting property of logarithm. The natural logarithm of an exponential function of x is simply x. So the natural log and the e will cancel out, leaving you with the, um, the, the function that has been exponentiated, so which is just simply the x, all right? Now, so once we have the odds, which is the ratio of the probability that gives you the odds ratio, the exponential of the z, we can take the natural logarithm of the odds, which means we are taking the natural logarithm of the ratio of the probabilities, that is the natural log of the odds ratio, which is the log of the exponential of z, and that simply gives us the z, which is the log odds. And so this log odds is what we are just representing with the letter L. So remember that we said that our z for which we are calculating the logistic regression model is simply the log odds, then this regression equation is just the L, the log of the odds ratio. So where this L is the log of the odds ratio, and it's just not only linear in X, it is also linear in the parameters. So this L part there, which is represented by the log of the odds ratio is why we call it logit, and hence the logit model or the logistic regression model. Now, key takeaways. The logits, which is the log odds, are not bounded by zero and one because you can actually have the log odds of maybe 200, the log odds of 500, the log odds of 1,000. But the probability, so which means after getting the log odds, we need to determine the odds and go on ahead and calculate the probabilities. And so that will make the probabilities lie between zero and one. And in order to calculate for probabilities for logit models, we need to calculate what we call the marginal effects. Now, although the logit is linear in X, but the probabilities are not, which let, uh, we earlier on the lectures we, we determined, right? And you can also include as many predictors. Here, we are just using the fact that the family owns a house, given the family income. So we have only one independent variable, but you can include as many independent variables that you want. Now, if L, which is the logit, after estimating the model, if the value of the log odds is positive, it means that when the independent variable increases by a unit, then the odds, all right, that the dependent variable is going to be equal to one will also increase because it's positive. If the logit, the log odds that you calculate for the regression coefficient is negative, it means that if the independent variable also increases by a unit, then the probability, sorry, the odds that the dependent variable is going to be equal to one will also decrease because there is a negative relationship right there. All right, so these are some of the things that we need to actually look at. Hence the probit model. Now the probit is just um, the same cumulative distribution function, but now it uses what we call a standardized normal cumulative distribution function. And if a variable X is said to follow the normal distribution with mean mu and standard deviation of sigma, then the probability distribution function is given as this. This is what defines the central limit theorem but the cumulative distribution function becomes this with an integral sign introduced, all right? But we are not going into the details to understand how these functions come about, but we should just understand that the probit model uses a standardized normal cumulative distribution function. Great, so if the probit model is such that we are just estimating the beta zero plus beta one X, then we are just saying the probit model is some function of that regression equation. But we are letting z, which earlier on we defined, to be equal to the beta 0 plus beta 1. Then we can just substitute into the cumulative distribution function. And you can see it right there, All right? Now, key notes with logit and probit models. Both models estimate the log odds. But logit follows a logistic cumulative distribution function, whilst the probit follows a standard normal cumulative distribution function. To express the coefficient that you have estimated, which is already in the log odds, 
you want to express these coefficients in probabilities, we need to calculate what we call the marginal effects. All right. Both models have predicted probabilities lying between zero and one inclusive. So this does not violate the fundamental rule of probability. Both models are also estimated using an iterative algorithm to calculate the log odds of the regression coefficient. Such method of estimation is called the maximum likelihood estimation. Now, a discussion on how this maximum likelihood estimation is done is beyond the scope of this particular lecture. But just know that um, I think 99% of uh, statistical software actually use the maximum likelihood estimation when it comes to logistic regression and probit models. So we have state time using that. Um, SPSS using that, R is also using it, so we don't have a problem, all right? But there's another method for estimating some of these, um, uh, the fact that a dependent variable is binary, that is called the non-linear least squares, but it is a little bit prob problematic. So we just kind of use this maximum likelihood estimation, which is the fundamental estimation technique for estimating logic and probit models. Now, if you want to estimate logit and probit, which technically would have the coefficient in their logos, we are going to use the GLM function in R, which is part of the base package. And if you want to estimate the probabilities of the regression coefficient, then we need to install a package called MFX. And inside of this MFX package, we have the logit MFX and the probit MFX. Now the MFX simply is kind of abbreviation for marginal effects, all right? So we are calculating the marginal effects for logit. So logit MFX, probit MFX, so that we can get the probabilities instead of the log odds. If you want to determine the goodness of fit of logit and probit models, then um, because it uses the maximum likelihood estimation, it is just kind of running some, like we said, iterative algorithm behind the scene. So it is trying different combinations of using whatever that maximum likelihood estimation to determine the model that produces the most likely occurrence that the probability that the family is going to own a house. That is the dependent variable is going to be equal to one, all right? And so it is not an absolute model in the form of linear regression model where if you just run the model and you summarize it, you simply have the R squared spitted out for you. But for this one, it conducts an algorithm, okay? Iterative algorithm behind the scenes and then just spills out which one has the log likelihood that your dependent variable is going to be equal to the one for which you are estimating. And so it doesn't accompany it with an R square because there are several models with different log likelihoods, but the maximum likelihood is what is going to uh, spit out. So which means we have to calculate our R squared by ourselves. So it is not a conventional R squared that we normally get in linear regression models. So we call this one the pseudo R squared. And so R provides the attributes of the models that you have estimated, which are called the deviance and the null deviance. So if you take the ratio of the deviance to the null deviance and subtract from one, you are getting the pseudo R squared. Another R squared you can also calculate is the count R squared, which simply means after predicting um, your dependent variable, you can just look at the number of correct predictions divided by the total number of observations, you are getting the count R squared. But the pseudo R squared is the easier of the two. So we are going to use that one because the deviance and null deviance are attributes of the model as long as we have estimated that, right? And then I think for EVUs, there is something that we call the McFadden R squared, but that is also beyond our scope. So we just leave it out and we'll go ahead and calculate the zero R squared. So at this point, we just simply go on ahead and then um, practice this in R. So we could just continue with the hypothetical data, yet I was very much interested in using that hypothetical data to make it very easy for us to look at how linear probability models work. And we got to realize that, yes, of course, we had predicted probabilities, some which are actually greater than one and some which are also less than zero. So we are just going to use a data set from Kaggle. And this data set actually over there, you're supposed to use a machine learning algorithms Yet in econometrics, some of these models have already been created for like the logit and the probit and all those sort of things. So we just go ahead and use it for our prediction, right? So about the data set, we are just going to predict the next day rate by training classification models, but we are not training, we are not doing machine learning. So we just go ahead and say that we are using the target variable that is called the rain tomorrow. And we are going to use a linear probability model. And then we'll use um, the logit 
and that of the probit, and we'll just determine which one is able to predict it better. That is all that we are trying to do, understand it from a chronometric perspective, not from machine learning uh, perspective, all right? Okay, so this data set contains about 10 years of daily weather observations from many locations across Australia. And the predicted variable, I mean, the target variable to predict is rain tomorrow, which is part of the data set. And it means that we are just asking, did it rain the next day? Yes or no? So if it is yes, we just simply assign the value of one. If it is no, we just simply assign the value of zero. But how did it come by the yes? You can read this information and know how everything goes, all right? So we have everything in the script. When I make it available, you go ahead and look at it. And so these are some of the variables in the model. We have the date, we have location, minimum temperature, maximum temperature, rainfall, evaporation, sunshine, um, the strongest wind gas direction, uh, the speed of, of the strongest wind. We have direction of the wind at 9 a.m., wind direction at 3 p.m., wind speed at 9 a.m., wind speed 3 p.m. We have the humidity at 9 a.m., 3 p.m., pressure 9 a.m., 3 p.m., cloud, we have so many variables there, right? Temperature at 9 a.m., 3 p.m. And then we have a variable called rain today, okay, which is also a Boolean such that one, if it rained, and zero, if it did not. So we can use this one to also predict whether it is going to rain tomorrow. So we have uh, rains today, Okay, and how they were able to create the Boolean expressions of one being it rained today and then zero means it did not rain today. But the target variable is this one, rain tomorrow here, which is the amount of next day rain that we are going to um, predict. So we need to call this data into R. So we'll just go on ahead and let's simply call this weather AUS, so weather Australia, right? And then we'll just simply say read.csv. And if I go into the files, my working directory, I have named it as weather Australia. So weather aus.csv. So we just run that. It is running behind the scenes. Now it has been imported. So if you go ahead and click on the data frame object in the environment window, you can now clearly see your data set. And there are 145,460 observations and 23 variables, including the date, the location, minimum temperature, and all those sort of variables that we have there, right? So technically, what we need to do right now is we need to visualize for whether there are, all right, missing data. And so in order to do this, um, there is a package. Hmm install.packages, um, which is called the vizdat, okay? So visualize data. And then we'll load it in memory, so. And then there is another package, another package, dlookr, yeah, dlookr. So we also have it installed, yep. And so I'll just go on ahead and load the vizdat package and then the D lookup. So if you don't have these packages installed, just simply go on ahead. By chances, you have, you have them already installed because in our previous lessons, we introduced this one when we're dealing with the statistical concepts of statistical inference. So the D lookup has been loaded. And now what we need to do is to use a function which is called the plot NA Pareto. So plot NA Pareto and just simply pass into it the data frame. So weather AUS, okay, weather in Australia. So if you kind of run this line of code, it is going to create a Pareto chart of all the variables that have missing data, right? So when we zoom into the plot, we see that sunshine, evaporation, cloud at 3 p.m., the cloud at 9 a.m., all of them have um, a lot of missing values which have been labeled as bad, all right? And so if the missing value is still less than 50%, actually, you can impute it, but it is not worth it because it is bad. Somehow it is bad. If it is actually greater than 50% or 50% or more, then you can simply remove the variable from there. But um, this is very bad and it will be very bad of us to impute it 
And so we have a lot of observation because we have 145,000 observations. So by getting rid of all the missing values will not really create so much problem because we might still have enough data to work around. So what about the this that? There is a function called this miss that is a visualized missing data. And you can also pass in the name of the data frame and then just simply run that. And it says data exceeds recommended size for visualization. Please consider down sampling your data or set argument one large data to false. Okay, so that is exactly what I need. So I will just set the one large data argument to false like that so that I ask out to ignore the fact that the data is just so huge. So visualize it for me anyway. So I think the Pareto chart of the missing values is much better from the DLOCAL package. So whilst the visualization is being created, let me just bring this function beneath its own package so you can clearly distinguish between the two. Of course, it is very huge. So that is why it's taking a lot of time in giving us what we need. So let me just stop it right here, interrupt it. And now it's using about 1.17 gigabyte of my RAM. So I will just simply click on this arrow right here and then click on free unused, um, what, what was the label? Yeah, okay, so free unused memory and rerun my code. And at this point, I think it should do that for us. So the reason why some of these things are actually done is there are instances where a lot of people encounter certain issues in their R studio. And sometimes it is not because the code they've written is actually wrong. Um, yes, you can see it has a very huge um, data kind of thing. So to start a new session, oops. <laughs> All right, so that means we are going to lose um, our information, but we can still run it back. Okay, yeah, because now it no longer exists. So I can just come down here. Let's load the tidy verse because the session has restarted. And then we have a lot of things in memory. So by restarting the R Studio, we can go on ahead and do what we have to do. So let's call in this data. So we're not calling the hypothetical data. We're just calling the um, this data set that we are using. And now we were trying to visualize uh, from the VisDAT package. So I've loaded it and I will go ahead and run this again. In as much as R Studio is stubborn, I will force it to display what I need it to display. All right. So if I realize, well, it is proving so much stubborn, maybe I could just leave it and go on ahead with what I have to do. After all, the Pareto chart of the missing data um, was given to us, okay? It's using a lot of memory. So around 300 megabytes has jumped to 977, okay? So 1.22 gig, hmm. All right, that's quite huge. Okay, so anyway, let's just, oh, fine. I think it has just appeared, but it really stressed us up. Okay, so the visualizing of the missing data from the VisDAT package will give you this sort of a graph where you can see the proportion of missing data. So you can see that the total proportion of missing data is just 10.3%, all right? And then those values that are present constitute 89.7. So getting rid of all missing uh, values from this data set will not really harm our model that we are going to run, right? So we can see that for evaporation and sunshine, we have majority of the data missing there and cloud 9 a.m., cloud 3 p.m. and all of that. Okay, so at this point, um, the tidyverse has a function that can clear all missing data from it. So I'm just going to go ahead and use the same name, which is weather in Australia for the data frame. And then I will grab the same name of the data frame. And this time around, I'm just going to use the drop NA from the tidy app, all right? The drop NA function like this. And so if I go ahead and run that, okay? And if I click on the data frame, we saw some and this right at the very few observations up here, but you can see that all of them have clearly vanished, right? And so if we go on ahead to plot 
the Pareto chart, let's call in the D local package. Okay. And so if we tend to visualize, let's see whether our missing values, R is not responding to your requests. Hmm. Memory, do you want to terminate R now? No, I will not. Again, all right, yes. Okay, so allow it some time, okay? Because the data set is really, really huge. Very, very, very huge. So the library of the tidyverse. And then let me load my libraries before it restarts my... So library of Vista and then the D local. The D local normally takes a longer time to load. So at a point you are required to click on the stop icon here and it will load it by force, all right? So it has been loaded yet it was taking a longer time. And so that's one of the observations that I've made concerning my system actually. So if I go ahead and now call in my data set, there is no set file or directory. Okay, that is because we moved away from the directory. So if I click on files, it has taken me back to my default directory instead of the first one that I actually had. So at this point, I will just go on ahead and replicate the same code up here, all right? And then, so this one, I would say, you must be in the working directory. So use this one. Um, you must be in the working directory and then use this code if you have any other directory where the file is simply found, All right? So I will just go ahead and clear this name and simply use the file.choose argument in there. And then if I go ahead and run this, then I will simply pop up this select file and I will manually navigate to where the data set is our mentor class in financial statistics. And then this is the weather in Australia. So click on open. And then it will be loaded, great. And now I can go ahead and drop all missing values. And then let me go ahead and visualize the missing data using the VisDAT uh, package. I should have freed on use our memory first. Great. So you can now see that all of them have been dropped. All missing values have been dropped. And now the entire data um, is actually present. And it has reduced the number of observations from one about 145,000 to 56,000. And I think this is just enough for, for our prediction. All right. And so once we have this instance, you know what we have to do? Let's go on ahead and use the names function to determine the names of the columns, all right? So um, with the names of the columns, or maybe let me just click on this to visualize this, to create a table of that. And I would definitely not be using the location data because if I check perhaps the structure, so if I go ahead and say the STR of the weather in Australia, and I check the structure of this data frame. Now you can see that the location is actually character. If you make it categorical, you could see that there are a lot of locations where this data was located. And having so many categories would just um, make the model mark, right? So uh, somehow the location will not be part of it. And for the date, date is also not really a part of that unless we are dealing with time series forecasting, then the date will be a very necessary part of um, maybe regression models in time series. So date will also not be part, but we can go ahead and use the minimum temperature, maximum temperature, rainfall. So rainfall definitely should be, we have zero, zero values here. So let's go into the data and probably, yes. So the rainfall, okay, the rainfall is not categorical because I see a value of 1.6, 0.6, but I think there are instances where they are recording in millimeters. Yeah, if you look at the, um, description that we're giving to the variables up here. All right, so rainfall will be part of the independent variables. 
And so evaporation too will be part sunshine, but the wind gas direction. So maybe whether it moves south, southwest, or just the south or north, northeast, or west, northwest, I think we can make it categorical and make it part of the model. And then the speed of the wind, okay, and then the wind direction also at 9 a.m. is also categorical. We can also make them um, categorical variables and include them there. And definitely the rain today and rain tomorrow should also be categorical uh, data. So we need to convert these data types into factor data types. Now, if we were using machine learning in R, then it would have been easy for us to do this using a, a certain package called recipes. But because we are not there, uh, somehow we need to be able to do this a little bit manually. So what I'm going to do right now is I will grab the weather Australia followed by the dollar sign. And I will just simply grab. So let me just pull this one down a little bit. So let's start with um, the wind gas direction. All right. And then I will copy this same thing and I will just go ahead and make it as factor data type. And then I'll grab the weather in Australia again, followed by the dollar sign. And then I would, the wind direction 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. So wind direction 9 a.m. Let me copy this, making it very easy for me to paste it. So as factor and paste this one there. And then I'll copy the same thing, paste it here and make this one 3 p.m., right? So wind direction 3 p.m. So I'll change this one to, to wind direction 3 p.m. Like so. And then what other character data type? Rain today, rain tomorrow. So I will just come here, weather. Australia, dollar, and then the rain today as dot factor, and then weather Australia, the rain today. I could have used the, uh, the tidyverse, verse, right? I think that should have been the case. Anyway, I've finished doing this, so let me just go on ahead. So uh, rain tomorrow also should be uh, a factor data type. So as dot factor, and then I will have the weather, Australia, and then the rain tomorrow. So I will just go on ahead and run all of them at once. And then I will check the structure of the data frame. And you can see that the rain today is a factor data type with two levels, no and yes. So the first order okay, of the categories is going to be assigned the value of zero. And this one will be assigned the value of one. So zero and that of one. So if we come up here, the wind direction at 3 p.m. would have 16 levels. This is not going to be an easy thing, um, and uh, not a small model anyway, but we'll find a way to handle it. And then the wind direction at 9 a.m. too, we are going to have a factor with 16 levels um, as such. And we also have the direction of uh, wind gas also right here. So let's get rid of the date and location uh, data from there. So I will go ahead and say weather in Australia all right, and then weather in Australia, then I would use the chain operator and I would select, all right, but excluding the date. So it should be a vector. So a vector of date and then location, like so. So we just go on ahead and remove them. And if we should check the data frame again, you can see that the location and the dates are all gone, all right? Great. So when we do this, we can go ahead and now we need to estimate our linear probability model first. So we need to use our linear probability model first, but the linear probability model requires that the target variable should not be a factor data type, but rather as numbers, okay? So it treats as numbers. So it means, why don't we create another column where we are going to just coerce these values to numbers instead of factors because R will not treat it lightly because it knows that once it's a binary response variable, you should use 
maybe a, a method that uses that maximum likelihood estimation, which probably should be the GLM, the generalized linear model. So R knows that. So sometimes it prevents you from doing linear probability models if your categorical variable, which is the predicted one, the target variable should be factor data type or categorical, okay? So let's make it numeric. So let's create another column. So we'd set simply say weather in Australia and then weather in Australia. And we will create a new column, which should be rain tomorrow. Then let me just simply make it NUM, making it numeric, right? And then I would say as dots numeric, and then I will grab the rain tomorrow and simply make it numeric. So when I run this line of code, and then we go on ahead and check the structure of the data frame, then you can clearly see that we have another um, variable that has been, oh, sorry, let's see. Okay, here is supposed to be an equal sign instead of the uh, less than hyphen kind of thing. So let's run it again, okay? And then if we should check the structure of the data frame, so somehow this thing has become part of it. All right, so let me eliminate it just a little way. So I would say weather in Australia, um, weather Australia, and then I would select and then exclude rain, this one. All right, so it should just go off like so. So now we can go ahead and check the structure of the data frame. Yeah, so now we have all these variables that we need in a model and we have our rain tomorrow there, which is now numeric data type. And then we have the rain tomorrow, which is factor data type. All right, so at this point, we can now go ahead and estimate our linear probability model, the linear probability model, where we are going to create a model objects. And then we use the LM function and the variable should be rain tomorrow underscore numeric regressed on all other variables. But my data should be the weather in Australia where we simply take away the one which is factor data type. So rain tomorrow, all right? So we are going to use this as our dependent variable and then we are regressing it on all other variables in the, in the data. And then our data should be set to the same weather in Australia, but we just take out the one with the factor levels because if you don't do that, it is also going to treat this one as if it were an independent variable. So we just do this and run it. And then we can check the summary of the model. And so this is the result that we are getting right here. All right, great. So at the, at, at the same time, we can just say that there is a negative relationship between the minimum temperature and the probability that it is going to rain tomorrow. So we're just going to say that if the minimum temperature in Australia increases by whatever unit of measurement there is. So let's say it is just one, okay? If the minimum temperature increases by maybe one degree Celsius, then the probability that it will rain tomorrow will decrease okay by this value so which is when converted to percentage is just 0.7 percent but remember that we said the linear probability model generally would have low r squared so we have 37 percent r squared right here which is the goodness of fit and adjusted r squared is 36 percent the entire model is actually significant and we have a lot of variables here which are also kind of very, very significant, right? So using the linear probability model, the only problem this is going to have is if you kind of try to um, visualize the predicted probabilities are actually going to be, um, uh, we are going to have the predicted probability, some of them to have values greater than one and some of them also to be negative. That is the very real problem with linear probability model. If you want to get around that problem, one of the first things to do is to constrain it by assuming that the predicted probabilities, if greater than one should be one, if less than zero should be zero. And then that means we're also losing some sort of information. So I just want you to know that this is how we run a linear probability model. Now, we also need to go ahead and run the logit model. So I'll just make it logit. 
and then we'll use the GLM function. Now, one thing about the GLM function is it takes in a number of arguments. So let's see the documentation in R and then find out what sort of arguments this one is going to take. The first one is the formula. So I'm just going to go ahead and say rain tomorrow should be regressed on all other variables and our data should be equal to the weather in Australia. And then we need to select to remove the numeric variable that we created in the data. Okay, we need to remove it like so. So we have specified, let me break this one down. So we specified our formula. We are regressing to all other variables, but the data should be the entire data set, excluding the numeric rain tomorrow sort of um, variable there. Now we need to specify the family. If we go down there, the family is just trying to show the description of the error distribution and link function to be used in the model. So for GLM, it should be a character, all right? So we are just going to say a family should be equal to something. So what is it? If you click on this family right here, then the family objects for models should be family is binomial, all right? So binomial link is logit. So I'll just go ahead and copy this and paste it here. Okay, so if you just go ahead and say family equals binomial, by default, it is logit, but let's be very explicit. So family equals binomial, link equals logit. And that is just what we need. The rest you can maybe read for yourself at your own convenient time, right? So let's go back to what we're doing. So that is a logit right here. And if I go ahead and summarize the logit, but I want to go ahead and also deal with the probit where I'm going to grab the same lines of code as the logit because these are virtually siblings. And I will just simply change this link to probit. That's just all, all right? Very, very easy. Very, very easy. And so when this happens, we can go on ahead and then run this line of code for the logistic regression model, and then we can summarize it. So the way to interpret, so you can see somehow it's taking some longer time because it's using the number of iterations, okay? And so the number of Fisher scoring iterations used was six before it was able to spit out the, the model that gives us the maximum likelihood that our there's going to be rain tomorrow. Good. So when you are explaining the coefficient for the linear probability model, then you would have to use the probabilities because the coefficients are already in probabilities. But when using the logit, the coefficients are in the log odds. All right. The coefficients are in the log odds. So this means that if minimum temperature increases, if there's a negative relationship here. So if minimum temperature increases, then the likelihood that it is going to rain tomorrow also decreases by the log odds of 0 0.036. If you take the maximum temperature, there is a positive relationship. So the way to interpret this is if the maximum temperature in Australia at any given day increases by maybe one degree Celsius, then the likelihood that it is going to rain tomorrow also increases by the log odds of 0 0.014, all right? So when interpreting it, we use the log odds because these coefficients are already in the log odds. Then if the wind direction blows in the east northeast, okay? So if the wind blows in the east northeast direction, then the likelihood that it is going to rain tomorrow decreases by the log odds of 0 0.133. That is how you interpret it. So these are the interpretation for uh, the independent variables, which are also categorical, all right, all right? So here too, if I'm taking this very value, then I'm saying that if the wind blows in the southeast direction, then the likelihood that it's going to rain tomorrow also increases by the log odds of 0 0.162.
So remember that logit and probit simply are estimated, the regression coefficients in logit and probit are estimated using the logo. So that is how you have to explain it. So when you also go ahead and estimate the probit model, and then you summarize the probit, that also uses a certain number of iterations using the maximum likelihood, and it uses the six. And then you can also see clearly that when the minimum temperature increases by one degree Celsius, if that is a unit of measurement, then the likelihood that is going to rain tomorrow also decreases by the log odds of this value. Okay. If I go down here and then I say that if the humidity at 9 a.m. increases, I think the unit of measurement for humidity, hmm, I've really forgotten that. I've forgotten it anyway. But um, if the humidity at 9 a.m. is increases by maybe one unit, then the likelihood that it's going to rain tomorrow will also increase by the log odds of this very value. All right. And then down here to the rain today, yes, is going to be such that, in fact, if it rains today, then the likelihood is going to rain tomorrow increases by the log odds of 0 0.2749. So these are not in percentages, these are in log odds. Now, you, you know something, there is a function in R called the coef, all right, which graphs the coefficients of objects. So for instance, if I put in the linear regression model, which is the linear probability model that we have estimated up here, then I can go on ahead and then fish out just only the coefficients. All right. So it gives us only the coefficients. OK, and there are a lot of variables in there, so we can see all of these, including the intercept term. So that is the coefficients that we are talking about here. So if I also go on ahead and say grab the coefficients from the logit model that we estimated, then these are also going to be the coefficients. OK. Then I can also go on ahead and grab the coefficient from the probit. And if you also run that, you are also going to get the coefficient from the probit model. Why do we have to use this coef function? Now, when you take the exponential function of a value, maybe the exponential function of one, it gives you what that value is, which is 2.718. So remember that the coefficients of the logit models and the probit models are in their log odds. So in order to find the odds, okay, which happens to be the odds ratio, remember we said we had to take the exponential function of the log odds. So which means we can just take the ESP function and then we pass into it maybe the exponential of logit like this and then run that. And so this is the result that we get. So this is the exponential of it. Okay, which is going to give us the odds, all right? And so if we look at this value, this is plus zero, zero, meaning that is just the normal value. If it were plus one, it means the point has been moved to the left one time, but this is just the same value. And this one, zero, one means the point has been moved one point to the right. So the real value is going to be, you move it back, which is 0 0.9123, okay? So here, if the wind blows in the southeast direction, then the odds that is going to rain tomorrow is just simply 1.17, just 1.17. That's the odds ratio. And it's going to be like 1.17 to none, okay? To, to, it will not rain. So the odds that is going to rain tomorrow is 1.17. That's the odds ratio. So let me just put it in a nice interpretation statement form. I'm going to say that, if the wind blows in the southeast direction, then the likelihood that it will rain tomorrow increases by the odds ratio of 1.1769794, all right? If I also come here, and so if there is a wind direction at 9 a.m. in the west direction, okay, if there is a west directional wind movement, then the likelihood that it will rain tomorrow also increases by an odds ratio of 1.196, all right? So that's technically how we interpret some of these uh, odds ratio and all those sort of things. So when you take the exponential of the coefficient of the logit, you get simply the odds ratio. Good. Now, after getting the odds ratio, you can just divide the odds, okay, by one plus the odds, and then you get the probability. 
So like, for instance, if I grab this value, which is if it rains today, then the likelihood it will rain tomorrow increases by the odds ratio of 1.605, whatever. So if I take this value and then I divide by one plus this value, which is the odds, then the probability that it is going to rain tomorrow is 62%. So the odds divided by one plus the odds will simply give you the probability, all right? So the probability, if it rains today, then the probability it will rain tomorrow is just around 62%. So how do we calculate these probabilities? Do we have to do that manually for each of them? This is where the package called MFX comes into the scene. So what we are going to do is, we'll just go on ahead and just install the package that is called MFX. And then we use the library and load the MFX package. So by loading this package, because I have it installed already, then I can go on ahead and say, logit MFX, which would take in the formula and the data. That is all that it needs. So what would be the formula? So come to where the logit is, grab all of these here. It only takes in the formula and the data, not the family. So by pasting this in here, I can just clear the family out of that and have only my formula and the data. And it does the logic and everything behind the scenes, but gives us um, the probabilities that we need. So logit MFX, rain tomorrow on everything, where our data, okay, yeah, so we need to close the parentheses here. Then I can grab this same line of code. And then you don't have to calculate the magna effects for linear probability models because they're already in probabilities, but you can calculate that for logit and the probit. So by running this line of code, error in select. Okay, so I think um, what we have to do is to make sure that we do not filter our data but we can just grab this here. So we can grab this and create a subset. So let's say weather Australia. All right. And let's do this so that we take away the numeric, which was used in the linear probability model away. So that will be stored into the original uh, data frame. Error in select. Oh, sorry. I think, is it a tidyverse? The tidyverse, have I loaded it? All right, so I think it has to do with the tidyverse, yeah. If not, then something is really wrong here. So if I go on ahead and run this, error in, oh, okay. So probably the problem that we are facing now, it's very good that some of these things are actually happening. When coding, you encounter these problems. It says error in select. There is an unused argument, all right? So somehow, you know, this select may be some of the conflicts. Remember when you attach the tidyverse package, it gives you some warning message down somewhere saying that there are certain conflicts, which means there are certain packages that also contain this same select function. And so by running it, it is not tracing it to the tidyverse select in dplyr. It is tracing it to a select in another function. That is the problem that we are facing right here. So it means that in order to, I tell R that we are using the select from dplyr in the tidyverse, we can go ahead and just have this dplyr and the double colon sign, bef colon sign before it, and then run it again. And you see that gives you your result. So when you check the data, the numeric column that we created is now gone. So when this happens, we can now go on ahead and use the weather in Australia and we don't have to select anything because we have already taken it off, all right? So the logit MFX, now I can go on ahead and run this and it's going to give us the probabilities. So when you are creating your table and reporting it, you can have your estimated, um, values there, the estimate that is a regression coefficient, your standard errors, which are all given from the model, and then your T values, your probability values. Then you can even append a column called the odds ratio by taking the exponential of 
each of these coefficients, and then the probabilities as well, which is the, the marginal effect. But the marginal effect will also come by itself right here. So this is the marginal effects that we have here. So these are the probabilities. So it uses some kind of um, manipulation somewhere behind the scene, but we didn't consider how the marginal effects uh, comes about, but there is a way of getting it back because I'll get it for us automatically. We are just okay with it. So what we are just trying to say is that if the minimum temperature now increases by one degree Celsius, then the probability it will rain tomorrow um, decreases by 0 0.3, so about 0.4%, because we have to convert this one to percentage in probability. Or you can say the probability, it decreases by 0 0.004, fine. Or you can convert to percentage. So let me grab like this one. If the wind blows in the north, north direction, then in the north direction, then the probability that it will rain tomorrow decreases by 2.4%, okay? If I go on ahead to the rain yes, today, yes, yeah. So if it rains today, the probability that it will rain um, tomorrow increases by about 6%, okay? So there's a 6% probability it will rain tomorrow if indeed it rains today, all right? So that is for the logit MFX. And then this is also for the probit MFX. Now, the thing is, it is not guaranteed that the exact values that you get in logit is going to be the same values you get in probit because each uses different cumulative distribution functions, all right? But if it is negative in logit, it will be negative in probit. If it is positive in logit, it will be positive in probit. That is one thing that you must understand from there. It's taking some time because there are a lot of variables to do the estimation. So what the MFX is doing is it calculates using the maximum likelihood estimation behind the scenes, which actually gives us when we are using the GLM function and then gives us the log out, then it automatically finds the exponential of the coefficient to give you the odds and then will do the odds divided by one plus the odds to give you the probability and now report it for you with the standard errors and all those sort of things, okay? So that is exactly what R is doing behind the scenes. And that is why for a, num a lot of predictors, we actually end up getting, um, a a a taking a lot of time in giving us the output. So we have, this is technically, if we're using logic or probate, this is what you're actually going to uh, report, all right? So that is something that we just need to look at over here. Okay, now one last thing and we bring our lesson to an end is that there is a package called the Stargazer, which allows us to visualize regression models. There's also another one um, that is called the SJ plot, but that's another thing for another time. So with the Stargazer, that is just a, a bonus lecture. So we're just bringing our lesson to an end. So just go ahead and install the Stargazer uh, package and then load it in memory, so library of stargazer. And then you use the stargazer function from the stargazer package. And then you pass into it the model that you have created. So this model is for the one with the linear probability model, right? And so when you just do that, we are just going to set the type to be equal to text. When you do that, let's simply run this line of code. And then it gives you a very nice table of the regression result for the linear probability model, all right? So let me go up here. And so we have our dependent variable is the rain tomorrow, uh, which is the numeric version of that. And then we have our minimum temperature or the coefficients. And so these are the coefficients, the three stars indicate they are significant. These ones in the parentheses indicate that um, it is a standard error, all right? So you can see that the standard errors are very, very small. Okay, so that is what we have. And then when you come down here, we do have the number of observations, 56,000. The R squared value is 37%. Adjusted R squared, 37 approximately. There's a residual standard error. The F statistic is this value, which shows that it is very significant. The entire model is significant with degrees of freedom numerator and that of denominator. So we have this star gazer giving you a lot of information. There are so many things that you can actually be tweaking inside the star gazer. So all you have to do is to go on ahead and check the documentation on star gazer and you have a whole lot of things to do in there, all right? We have so many arguments, you can just be experimenting with them, but I will just give you what you need to visualize 
or to create a table of the regression results. So you cannot just pass only one model, but you can pass several models. But let me just also create a table of the logic that we created and the type equals text. After that, we put it all together and then you will notice the difference. All right, you will notice the difference. So let me just clear it and then rerun the logic results. And I will just show you a, a, a little difference in there. The stargazer. So here, of course, it used the rain tomorrow as the target variable, and all these variables, the standard errors in parentheses, the coefficients and its significance. If we come down here, we can get information like the observations, we can get the log likelihood, we can get the archaic information criterion. And um, before I put it all together, remember we said you can measure the goodness of faith, which is a pseudo R squared. So if you use a function called attributes, let me bring it up here. If you use a function that is called um, attributes, all right, of logit, for instance, and you run it, we have coefficient, residuals, fitted values. So the values have already been fitted. You can just call it, and then you have the fitted values, the predicted uh, values that we are talking about here. We have the effect. So what we need is the deviance, and then the null deviance. And remember, we said to calculate for the pseudo R squared. So let me just call it pseudo. R2, okay, for the logit. So pseudo R2 logit. Then I will have to grab the logit and then use the dollar sign to access the names in there. And I need the deviance. But remember, we have to divide the deviance by the null deviance. And then we subtract this value from one, and that gives us the pseudo R squared, okay? And so I will go ahead and grab this again, and then we'll make this one probit, and change this one to probit, and change this one to probit. And so the pseudo R squared for logit, and then the pseudo R squared for probit. And if we just look at them here, you, we have 37%, and then that of the probate, we also have 37%, really, really, really close, right? Really, really, really close. But remember, after estimating the model, you need to go ahead and do model diagnostics. So the R squared is fairly the same as the R squared that we had in, um, almost similar to the R squared that we had in the linear probability model. But one of the problems of linear probability models has a very low R squared. So this is almost the same as that of the linear probability models R squared. Okay. So maybe you have to go ahead and find out whether there exists multicollinearity, heteroscedasticity, but these are things that we are not going to consider for this very lesson. Okay. So we just want to understand how to run the logic and the marginal effects. So you can go ahead and do the model diagnostics to check for heteroscedasticity, autocorrelation and the multicollinearity, remove those variables that you think are causing multicollinearity, and you are going to have a very good R square value, probably higher than that of the linear probability model. So these are some of the things that you need to observe. So finally, we just go on ahead and start gazer. We put in the linear probability model, we put in the logit, we put in the probit, and then if we set the type equals text, there should be a comma here. All right, so we are bringing all the models together. That's the reason why we have these three ellipses. So you bring all the models together. It can take, I think, up to up to six models. So if I go on ahead and then run this, all right, then it is going to give us the linear probability model, the logit, and the probit side by side. Wonderfully. Very, very, very nice table. And then you can clearly see from the table that we have OLS. So it identifies what sort of methodology you use in the estimation. And then here, logistic, and here, the probit. And the dependent variable is rain tomorrow for both logistic and probit, but the independent, the dependent variable for the um, linear probability model is rain tomorrow underscore NUM, all right? So that is exactly how these things come about with the sort of information that you need all right here, okay? So this one is just to produce the table right in the R console. But if you want to get your nice table, which you can actually copy to a web document or a research paper, then all you have to do is to change this type equals text to HTML. 
and then use another argument called out and then set it equal to the name of the HTML file. So maybe let's call it um, mentor, um, mentor models dot HTML, right? So let's give it a name. So mentor models dot HTML. And if I should run it, it will produce HTML code. All right, if you don't understand it, don't worry. But if you go to your working directory, you will find this mentor models.html file there. Open it to your web browser, and then you will see a very nice table. So um, let it finish what it's supposed to do. Great. Now let me come here and search. So mentor models. Mentor models is supposed to be in my working directory. So if I click on the files right here, you can see we have the mentor models.html. All right. And I want to open it. So mentor. Okay, where is it? In my documents. Okay. So I'll just go to documents. Mentor models. We have it right here. So double click on it and open in your web browser. And then you have a very nice table, all right, with whatever you have here. So OLS, logistic, and probit. And then you can press Control A on your keyboard, Control C to copy, and then go to a Word document, and then simply paste it there. Right, so keep source formatting. Yeah, so keep source formatting. Right, so you can now have a very nice table of a result, but there are so many, many independent variables and that is why uh, it is just so long. So if this is the result that you wanted, then exactly this is how you do it. And if you want to report, I believe you know how to do that in, in, in the word, okay. So you can see that the minimum temperature is negative all across, just that this one is the log odds, log odds, but this one becomes a probability, all right, in OLS, okay, hmm, something like that. So um, you can also have a way to visualize or create a table of your logit M effect, the marginal effect, which is in the probabilities themselves, and you can go ahead and do that. Maybe one day we'll have a session on how to visualize regression models. Now that we have dealt with linear regression, logistic, probate and linear probability models, we'll look at maybe how one day, how we can visualize all these uh, models all together, which will be very good for research papers and all of that. So at this point, I will just simply go back to the slides and I would say thank you all very much for the attendance. It has truly been a, a very long journey uh, through all these modeling sort of things, all right? So uh, let's bear with the time. And I believe we'll meet next time for comparing two models where we look at other statistical inference concepts. And I believe uh, we are learning a lot. So keep on practicing and we'll meet uh, next time. Thank you very much.